Welcome back, honors. All right, welcome back to it. I didn't mean to scare you, baby. I am sorry. All right, so like now the big thing about it is, though, is welcome to my house. Welcome to about 6.36 in the morning, and we're still this synergetic, and it's going to be fun. All right, so really, really quick, we are going to jump right in where we left off in class, right, talking about the ancient Egyptians, getting into some more of their, like, historiography and stuff like that. Now, the big thing about it is, like, I do want to go ahead and address that we were talking about a ton of different ancient Egyptian historical, and not, well, excuse me, that was wrong. Let me recorrect that a little bit. We were not talking about ancient Egyptian historical events we were actually talking about ancient Egyptian cultural ideals for the entirety of that first flip right so this is where things can get a little bit confusing for me. stop licking me all right so like that can get a little bit confusing for people in a lot of different ways is that whenever we talk about these ancient societies we always talk about their geography first their culture first their history Ooh, excuse me their history last their geography first their culture next their history last right so the big thing about it is in that last couple flips and in that last class, we were really talking a lot about how the geography affected the ancient Egyptians and their foundings, how like their culture is going to actually mirror their geography, how their religion works, how their theocracy works, how all that stuff works, how we got this little Anubis baby right here. <laughs> All right, so now the big thing about it, though, in general, though, is you also have to understand we're now moving in to all the historical stuff. We're now going into everything that has to do with what happened there, a general timeline of this very ancient, very intense civilization, right? And I had a couple of girls stop by yesterday during S period. They were like, look, I'm confused about this thing or whatever. So look, the religion stuff, remember, okay, the religion stuff, it just is what it is. And it'll make more sense as we go, all right? It'll, like, because we were just talking about how Egypt was a polytheistic civilization, how their main gods were at one point Amun and Ra, and then they mushed them together and created... Amun-Ra later on, and something that you need to understand about ancient societies is that their religion does go through reforms over time, right? And all those reforms happen mainly during their, like, historical periods, right? So the big thing about it is we're now getting into the seven time periods of ancient Egypt. Now, some of y'all are probably asking yourself, like, we never talked about time periods in Mesopotamia. Well, time periods in Mesopotamia are more measured by the city-state that's in control, right? So when we were like Sumeria, Akkadia, Babylon, Assyria, Neo-Babylon, right? And then later on, the very last will be the Persians. Whenever we're talking about all that stuff, that's kind of their time periods because it helps us, helps us track our way through their entirety of their history. In ancient Egypt, on the other hand, they were one large centralized kingdom with a uniform culture that spanned the entirety of the Nile. So with that in mind, you need to understand that they have, <coughs> excuse me, you need to understand that the Egyptians have seven time periods that all happen in order, and they go like this, right? They go the Archaic period, the Old Kingdom period, the First Intermediate. Now here's where the Egyptian time periods get really, really easy, right? They get really, really easy because now they're just going to start going in a rhythm, hopping back and forth. Bang, 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 bang. This is so easy to remember, it's ridiculous, right? Because it goes Archaic Period, Old Kingdom Period, First Intermediate, Middle Kingdom Period, Second Intermediate, New Kingdom Period, Third Intermediate, right? So as you can see, the Egyptians have like a very nice pattern and rhythm to their historiography, right? And when we're saying that word all the time, I use that word a lot, historiography, right? It's kind of understanding the layout of events and causality whenever you're talking about entire civilizations or even just like periods of time in general. Historiography gives us the ability to study the track and progression of historical societies, right? And gives us the ability to look at the rhythm of their societies and try to find sense in the chaos, right? And so we're using historiography here as we can see they have one period known as the archaic period and then we go a kingdom and intermediate a kingdom and intermediate a kingdom and intermediate and this entire civilization spans from give or take around 3100 bc in the archaic period going all the way up to about like give or take about like 15 or not 1500 about 1000 or close to 800 like B bc as well okay so looking at this entire thing though is where are there other time periods after like 664 so 664 bc is the end of the third intermediate period right it's the end of this other period where some of you are like i don't know what intermediate period is well look there are other time periods after 664 the egyptian culture goes all the way up until the time of the romans right literally they interacted with julius caesar and Kelsey Yana has asked a very big question the other day. Are we ever going to get to talk about Cleopatra, right? And we do. She's actually the very last 
ruler of Egypt, right? She is the very last Egyptian ruler of Egypt, right? And she has a phenomenal story, but she doesn't even come up and doesn't even really show up until about like, eh, give or take, about like 55, like 55, like BC, 55 BC. So as you can tell, Egypt's been there for a really, really long time. But when we're talking about their ancient culture and their periods of progress and sole autonomous rule, that's a really big thing here in general, is that this is all going to be going down. These periods are going to mainly exist when Egyptians are ruling over other Egyptians and when Egyptian culture was at its highest, right? So going forward and starting off with everything, the very first period you always have to talk about when you're talking about ancient Egypt is the Archaic period, right? And so the Archaic period started around 3100 BC, of course, it has to do with mostly like Egypt's foundings, the earliest um, items of construction, earliest like large pieces of like architecture and stuff. Ooh. Sorry, smoothie. Eat breakfast. Now, so the big thing about that in general is that the archaic period is mostly around that word archaic, right? The word archaic actually means old way or of original use, right? And it's characterized by the unification of Egypt, right? So as we remember from the last flip, Egypt started out as two separate kingdoms. There was like an upper Egypt and a lower Egypt, and then they're going to combine the two kingdoms together with Memphis being their capital city, right? Now, the archaic period, that old way or original use characterized by the unification of Egypt, was all characterized by one particular pharaoh, the first pharaoh, the very first guy to come along. And this is a little small statue of his noggin. This is his death mask, and of course, his name is Menes, right? Menes is the guy that comes along and unifies the kingdoms together and creates a giant Egyptian kingdom that has one body, one capital city, and also has one uniform culture, language, etc. Right? They are later going to have one uniform writing system. They're going to have systematic ways of writing that using stone, and then later on developing papyrus scrolls. And so, going into it, Menes is a very important figure. He is going to be on your test because he pops up multiple times. So a good thing to do right now is maybe to highlight his name in a color that you don't use all the time in your notes, right? So you can kind of easily see your way through your notes and be like, ooh, person, 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 right? So Menes is also going to have a very intense life. He's going to be considered the very first pharaoh of ancient Egypt, of the very first dynasty. And the other thing about it that you need to understand is that he has a hilarious death. Apparently, according to tradition and according to uh, <clears throat> like actual Egyptology and Egypt history, apparently, like Menes was on his one of his a large barge on the Nile River and was like like on a pleasure cruise and was hanging out and just having a party. And then he must have either fallen off or ended up in the water or something like that. And we believe that he died from being killed by a hippopotamus. All right, so like Menes, death by hippo. Real rough. They actually kill more more people in Africa than all the other big predators combined. So, like, now, the big thing about it, though, in general, is once the archaic period kind of ends and we start seeing a growth of art and culture and stuff like that in ancient Egypt, we're going to be then moving into what's known as the Old Kingdom period, right? Now, the Old Kingdom period is the very first of the three kingdom periods, right? Because look at the, like, progression of that historiographical, like, understanding. Old Kingdom, first intermediate. New, middle Kingdom, second intermediate. New Kingdom, like third intermediate. So obviously, as we can tell, that there's a kingdom type and an intermediate type, right? Well, in general, you have to understand that the kingdom periods are all characterized by cultural growth and prosperity. They're all culturalized by, or like, excuse me, they're all like characterized by a good time period, a period of good things, a period of positivity in ancient Egypt where people are progressing, progressing, and actually making like money and art and good things happen, right? And then the, uh, oh, good Lord, the intermediate periods are to follow were characterized by hardship and death, right? Like I so said, like they usually have wars or civil wars or uprisings or revolts in these intermediate periods, which cause disunity and dysfunction within the Egyptian area, right? So within the Egyptian civilization. So as you can see, the old kingdom is going to see, see some of the growth of some of the earliest forms of art. It's going to see the growth of some of the earliest forms of large architecture. And it's going to have some very important pharaohs that pop up that do some things that create some systems that we still kind of use today, which is a really, really interesting part. So the big thing about it is, starting off with the Old Kingdom, you have to understand that it spanned from the 3rd to the 6th dynasties. Now this is another big thing as well when we're progressing our way through kingdoms and intermediate periods and stuff like that. We usually track them in historical communities using the dynasties in ancient Egypt, right? Usually, for example, whenever you talk about the New Kingdom, you talk about the 18th dynasty, which is considered one of the most prosperous and best 
like dynasties out of the entirety of Egyptology and also in general, like the entirety of Egyptian history. That 18th dynasty included people like King Tut in the New Kingdom, his parents, which actually are going to have a very unique story that we're going to talk about a little bit later on as well. But this third to sixth dynasty in the Old Kingdom period is going to do some of the major infrastructure work that's going to allow that 18th dynasty to progress and actually be positive, right? The third to sixth dynasty is going to go from about 286 BC up to about 2181 BC, and it's going to be started by this guy named King Djoser, right? Djoser is a very important figure, all right? He is going to centralize the power in Europe, or not in Europe, excuse me, in Egypt by turning each state into what's called a gnome system, right? Now, this is a genius concept, right? What Djoser did was he actually looked at the entirety of the Egyptian kingdom, right? With Memphis being right here, close to the delta, but realizing that this entire southern region of Egypt includes cities and settlements and other people and things like that. How are you supposed to rule over them from so far away? So what he's going to do is he's going to create the gnome system, right? Where he divides all of the areas of the Nile into small sections that will have sectional governors or sectional leaders. At the time, they were called the nomarchs and stuff like that. Nomarchs were going to be important a little bit later. The nomarchs will then report back to the pharaoh, and we're going to create a more efficient system of tax collection. We're going to create a more efficient system of timekeeping, a more efficient system of like actual record keeping and things like that. And just so you understand... All of those things are super, super important. Tax collection especially, all right? So like, for example, in ancient Egypt, jot this down real quick, tax collection was done through grains, right? You actually like owed the empire, owed the kingdom a certain amount of grain or farmable goods, whatever you made that year, because Egyptians didn't use money, all right? Like they didn't actually use money. They actually had a grain system, grain exchange system, a lot like the Mesopotamians did, right? And the craziest thing about it is in ancient Egypt, if you didn't have enough stuff to give the tax collector, they beat you. Like, what the heck? But also, with the gnome system, it's going to make it so the entirety or the centralized capital of Memphis can track the floods, keep monitor of the calendar, this three-season calendar that they had, and make sure that everything is functioning the way that it's supposed to, right? So I love talking about Joser. I think he's got a really cool name as well. And the only reason I like his name a lot is because every single time I look at his name, I always think it's DJ Ozer, and that he's just like, you know, kind of like sitting on top of a pier pyramid and he's got like a turntable and he's just like DJing the entire time <laughs> kind of like this yeah I know you can find some crazy stuff on YouTube I literally just went in there and said DJing Pharaoh right so and that popped right up right but DJ Ozer or Joser is very important because he's going to establish that gnome system and the nomarchs will lead each of them right so going forward though the old kingdom period is also going to see the progression of like large-scale architecture the things that some of y'all probably know pretty friggin well about like oh the like ancient Egyptian culture right you're going to see the growth of the very very first pyramids, right? The Old Kingdom is considered the time period of about 500 years where the pharaohs began to actually build large pyramids, right? Now, just to give you a heads up to talk about the pyramids before we ever get there, those weren't the only things built during this time period. Everybody kind of just equates like, oh, ancient Egypt, everybody lived in a pyramid. No, they didn't, all right? So like, there are also lots and lots and lots and lots of other examples of architecture throughout ancient Egypt as well. For example, the Temple of Djoser, which is actually the ruins of that are right here, right? So the thing you need to realize is that the pyramids are also not going to look the best out the gate, right? And also you need to understand what they're used for, right? So the thing about it is these pyramids were used as tombs for royalty and nobles, right? Mainly just royalty, right? The like pharaohs would actually start the construction of these really, really large pyramid tombs, and they off, off, like oftentimes would be long dead by the time they were finally finished, right? So some examples of the earliest pyramids include the Medium Pyramid right here, which was started under the like actual like pharaohship of Djoser. This one is known as the Bent Pyramid, right? Uh, pay, pay, special, pay special attention to the size of it. We'll bring back that back up a little bit later, and then. Of course, this one I think is the Pyramid of Djoser as well. And so as you can see, I think this is actually in Saqqara, Egypt. I'm not positive though. So the big thing about it, as you can see, is this is not the conventional style pyramid that you've ever seen, but it's still really important to demonstrate that in the beginning of the Old Kingdom period, this large scale architecture is beginning, right? And then over time, the pyramids will get better and they'll actually start looking a lot more systematic and a lot cleaner with like cleaner lines and things like that. And so, for example, getting into it, the Old Kingdom period is the period 
period responsible for the people, like for the construction of the pyramids that you've probably seen or know best, right? The construction of the great pyramids of Giza and the Sphinx were like actually built during the Old Kingdom period as well. Now, the Great Pyramid of Giza, the main middle Great Pyramid of Giza, was actually built by an emperor named Khufu, right? What a name, right? Like, so Khufu is a very important figure that we'll talk about here in a second, but his was the largest of the three pyramids of Giza, the very, very massive one in the middle, right? Started when he was alive, finished long after he was dead, okay? And it showed a massive gain in architecture and Egyptian development, right? Art also began to progress with first full-form sculptures that would be representative art that would ever be seen in ancient Egypt, right? Now, the interesting little thing about Khufu in general and about this pyramid in general is we'll start off with the pyramid, right? The pyramid is absolutely massive. It's huge. It's somewhere in the neighborhood of like 20 stories tall or something like that, which is wild. Hey, Siri. How tall is the pyramid of Giza? And a story is 10 feet. Wow, let's take that back. 48 stories tall, which is ridiculous, right? It's over 481 feet in height, right? Now, other interesting little elements I actually realize as well is that it looked a lot better when it was first constructed, right? So let's pay attention really quickly. See how the sides are really, really rough and it looks almost like stone stacked one on top of each other? If you zoom in and you like pay special attention to the very, very top part, you can actually see that the pyramid used to have smooth sides to it. You used to actually be able to, well, I mean, like you wouldn't do it, but you used to have the ability to like ride a skateboard down the side of the, like the Egyptian pyramids because it had a smooth side to it. However, siding though was later on harvested when they were building the modern day city of Cairo, right? So like, and they actually took a lot of the limestone off and used it in the construction of more modern day cities that actually in Egypt. Now, that right there is the only surviving statue that we have of Khufu left, right? So it's only about this big. Like, so it's only about, like, I love how ironically enough he has the biggest pyramid, but the smallest statue. And reason why he has the biggest pyramid, but the smallest statue is a lot of historians believe that he might have been really, really, really disliked by his people. A lot of people, like historians believe that Khufu might have been hated. So like actually because of the construction of these pyramids and because it might have led to the death of so many people that maybe Khufu's like statues and like monuments and things like that were destroyed or broken or shattered by other people during the progression of Egyptian culture. Now the Sphinx of course is also a very, very famous piece that demonstrates the uh, like the actual Sphinx figure in their religious organization. And it's probably the most famous piece of large scale Egyptian uh, sculpture and then of course as you can see Egyptian art began to progress and they used to demonstrate full form sculptures and things like that and so as you can tell with the Old Kingdom period their intelligence is progressing as well then we're getting into the first intermediate period right now remember we are painting Egypt right now with a very broad brush reason being is because it's so much history. I'd have to have an entire year's worth of time to teach you ancient Egypt by itself. Their culture goes from 3100 BC all the way up to like 664. And if you include the time after that, it goes all the way up. It's like a 3000 year long culture, right? I mean, like, come on now. Like, that's crazy. All right. So like, they give me a whole year to teach just European history starting in 1450. Like, so like, the big thing about it, though, in general, is the first intermediate period, as you can tell, it's a lot shorter and stuff like that, lasts about like 130 years, um, is going to be a period of disruption and dysfunction, right? So what's going to happen is a series of civil wars and civil unrest is going to break out, right? The big thing that ended up going down is there was a dynastic lineage kind of situation that ended up happening where a lot of people started aligning with a certain pharaoh and the dynasties were changing over and political power was going to be divided between Upper Egypt, Lower Egypt, and there was even like a Middle Egypt there as well, like close to Thebes and stuff like that. Temples and tombs were pillaged and robbed. There was a massive amount of civil wars going on and Lower Egypt conquered Upper Egypt and reunified the land at the end, at the end, right? Like towards the end. So the big thing, as you can tell, is the first intermediate again is defined by that intermediate-esque kind of thing where it's a bad time, right? It's a really bad time. It's not good. It's not a good time for anybody, right? So the thing about it is we also, during this first intermediate period, are going to lose an expansive amount of Egyptian 
culture, arts, things like that. I guess so many things were robbed and pillaged and stuff like that. This sounds pretty bad, right? This sounds like a pretty bad time. That's why it's called one of our intermediate periods, right? So when Lower Egypt finally conquers Upper Egypt with the help of Thebes, the major city in the south, they actually are going to reunify the land. But the interesting part about it is when we're looking at this first intermediate period, how is it possible that you have this god emperor, right? How is it possible that you have this theocratic system, this theocracy system? How are you supposed to have a system like that and who's like, where, dude, like your leader is supposed to be god on earth, but then all of a sudden you're having civil wars and nonsense like that? Well, a lot of it has to relate to this very, very intrinsic concept in cultural Egypt known as Mot, right? And as you can see right here, we've got a lot of dysfunction, broken items. You're going to see the growth of the Egyptian military as well. But Mot is going to be a very, very important concept going forward, okay? So after the first intermediate period, the Pharaoh's position as a member of the religious society, as well as a member of the everyday accountability for his people, is actually going to increase. And so after the first intermediate period, you're going to see the growth of this concept called Mot, right? Mot. And so after the first intermediate period, the, action, the pharaoh encharged himself with the security of the people and with the preservation of this concept known as Mat, right? Mat is an Egyptian goddess, right? Mat is actually wearing something you've seen before, right? That right there is the feather of truth, right? That actually your heart was weighed against in their religion. And as you can see, her wings are outstretched and she is supposed to be keeping balance and prosperity, right? So the thing about it is Mat is the personification in Egyptian culture of harmony that is supposed to be kept through justice and truth. So Egyptians began to believe that it was the Pharaoh's job to uphold this balance of Mott, that by doing good things and promoting positivity in the kingdom and helping his people and making sure that everyone was provided for, that Mott would stay balanced and there would never be a civil war or a future civil war ever again which is a really good concept to remember, right? Help people out and they won't freak out. So the other big thing that's going to happen though is the Middle Kingdom using Mott and re of this rebirth in intelligence is going to occur and it's going to happen mostly during the 11th and 12th dynasties, right? So Mott guided by the, like, or excuse me, Pharaohs guided by Mott are going to like go out there and try to continually bring peace and prosperity to their people, right? Senseret is probably the most famous Middle Kingdom Pharaoh that there is. He's important. Go ahead and highlight him because a big thing that's going to happen with him is he's going to get rid of those nomarchs, right? The nomarchs were the people that led each of the gnomes when Joser or, you know, DJ Ozer. You remember him, right? <laughs> Exactly. So whenever he like actually made those gnomes, a nomarch was actually in power in each one of them. And over time, in the growth of Egypt, Mott was being violated, like Sinseret and his predecessors believed, because the nomarchs were taking too much power and subjugating some of the people in their gnomes, right? So Sinseret came in and eliminated the nomarchs and instead created the very first effective bureaucratic system that the ancient societies or history has ever seen. Now what a bureaucracy is is a multi-level government in which literally the pharaoh was at the very, very top, and then there was levels of people beneath them, right? And so as the pharaoh was at the top, he then had viziers and advisors, scribes underneath them who also did the tax collection and things like that, skilled artisans, peasants, and servants and slaves all the way down to the bottom. This created a system so the pharaoh didn't need the nomarchs anymore, right? Because he could just tell the viziers, who would go out and tell the scribes, who would send it out to the artisans, and then everything would pilfer its way throughout the rest of society, right? This bureaucratic system is very important. The best way to imagine the bureaucratic system in ancient Egypt created by Censoret is imagine the infrastructure at school, right? We've got Miss Dantagna at the very, very top, and then we got Miss Panzavecchia, and then we got the, the other administrators, and then we got, you know, the teachers, and then we got just parents, and then we got everyone else in society and then even garbage and then like you guys are like right underneath that okay cool good stuff y'all are part of the bureaucracy good job you're just at the bottom so now the big thing about it though as well is art and literature and architecture and trade are going to flourish during this time period mostly due to this guy's leadership right the censoret and the i believe he's in the 12th dynasty that it's actually occurred and this is going to be one of the most famous temples in egypt that's going to be opened during the 11th and 12th uh, dynasties this is the Temple of Karnak, right? So going forward, though, we're now going to be moving, lastly, into our second intermediate period, where the Egyptians aren't going to have a civil war this time. They're going to be invaded by somebody. They were invaded by a group of people known as 
the Hyksos, right? But we'll talk more about the Hyksos, not the Hyksos, when I see y'all in class tomorrow. Y'all have a good one.